Amen. How's it going, Decided Church? I will give you three guesses as to where we might be um, bringing today's service to you. If the pictures in the back didn't give you a hint, we are in my living room. How fun is that? Um, I know that things are a little bit different this week, but we are still so glad that you are online. We hope that you're viewing. Go ahead and share if you want to. And we'll hop right in to our next worship song. Y'all ready? Let's do it. Let's do it.
church. We make a miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Jesus, you are all those things and more. Thank you that even though we're doing things a little bit different today, that we can still proclaim those things that you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Jesus, we love you. And no matter where we are praising your name today, God, we know that it still counts. We love you and pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Welcome. It's been a long decade. One that gave us a new way. We're more connected than ever. Yet, we're more disconnected than ever. Rebellion is still glorified on platforms exposed to the masses. Loneliness is still on the rise. These things have not changed. And our God hasn't changed either. And so we stand firm. We're letting go of loneliness and we're choosing perseverance. We're letting go of pride. And we're choosing resolution. Letting go of rebellion, disorder, chaos, and we're choosing potential. As Christ followers, when we enter into joy, we change the game. We take it up and we carry it with us. It's universal so it doesn't have a language or a social class. It's contagious so it breaks barriers and it transcends cultures. Our joy isn't circumstantial, so when we enter into chaos, our joy remains, because who we're called to be shifts the atmosphere around us. It ushers in a spirit of unity. It unlocks freedom. No matter the burden, it lightens the load. It's joy season. 
Welcome to the 20s. Game changer. Hey, good morning, Decided Church. It's so good to be with you right here in the Jansen's living room. Believe it or not, this is how we all started. Uh, we started in the living room, so it's kind of fitting that we've come full circle. And we're doing church from a living room once again today, which is kind of cool. And we just had to close down the church. I'm sorry we had to do that. Um, but we had to close down meeting together for just a couple more weeks because of the rising, the spiking number of cases in South Carolina specifically. Um, it's... It's our job as a leadership team to protect and shepherd the flock, and part of that is also looking out for your health and your well-being. Um, so we are so grateful uh, that church is not a building, it's not a location, it's not four walls. We can do church right here from a living room. So we decided to step into your world. I know that y'all been watching from the living room consistently, so we thought we'd bring church to you from the Jansen's living room, which is super exciting very awesome um, but I think it's no it's no surprise that um, it, it is it is a little bit discouraging that we've had to close the church doors again for a little bit and I know we don't get to see each other like we want to and the church is going through some trials we really are the church is going through trials both uh, locally here at decided church and um, the church in general the capital C church going through some hard times. Um, if you didn't know, today is our first week of Grab Bag, and I hate that we didn't get to do it the way we normally do with the contest and the food and the timer. If you've ever played Grab Bag um, at, you know, like a, a youth thing or a retreat or a youth group going up, you're missing out. But Grab Bag is, the whole idea is um, it's random the sermons are not cohesive. They don't necessarily go together. It's not from one specific book. It's not from one specific topic. It's just kind of all the things that both Will and myself want to say, that we want to preach about, that we feel the Lord has for our church. And so I get to bring uh, the first message today in the, in the series Grab Bag, and then we actually get to hear from Mr. Eric Jansen next week. I'm excited about that. So good things are in store. Um, this is my first Sunday preaching with braces on. I don't know if you can see that, but I have braces on my bottom row, which is a new development. I just got those on Thursday, trying to straighten out my bottom row. And it's a really cool story because God provided these absolutely free. I'm not paying a dime for them. So that's cool. It's my second go around with braces. And this is a lesson to all you kids to wear your retainer because Pastor Jim did not. And now I'm having to get braces Again, and I'm, I hear some chirping over my left shoulder because we've got another pastor here who still wears his braces, or not his braces, his retainer faithfully, um, almost obsessively. He, he, uh, he bows before the idol of his retainer. I'm just kidding. But now let's get into it. These are unprecedented times. Uh, the church is going through some trials. Um, we, we've seen, you've seen on the news, you've seen in your social media, the division, the unrest the chaos, the movements, and we've met some more joy bullies along the way. If you remember from our, at the very beginning of the year, when we laid out our theme of joy, we laid out becoming game changers for this decade, we spoke in week three, and I'm going to cover a lot of weeks here, I'm going to re-preach some things this morning, but we covered in week three some of the joy bullies unrepentant sin, fear, comparison. We've met two more. And I don't think that we uh, intentionally left them out. I just think the events of 2020 have allowed our eyes to be open that there's some more joy bullies. And that is isolation. It's a joy bully. I think everybody here is aware that when, we, when we're not together and, and, and we don't get to gather like we normally do, it steals our joy. And the other joy bully uh, is opinion. Opinions steal our joy, especially when we elevate them, 
above their proper place. It's not wrong to have opinions. It's not wrong to think the way you think about certain things. But when we elevate those above each other, we elevate those above the, the greater good of the church and the word of God, they steal our joy. So we're going to take it all back to the beginning, and I'm going to preach a message to you entitled, It's Still Joy Season. Mm. It still is. It's still joy season. We started our year out talking about owning this decade. Uh, we introduced the 20s to you in a whole new light that you just saw in the video. Welcome to the 20s. Game changer. We could have never foreseen the events of 2020. We could have never foreseen COVID. We could have never foreseen the chaos and the unrest in our nation, politically, mostly speaking politically, um, but also economically, socially, racially. And I'm wondering this morning if we had to grade ourselves. We're halfway through the year. It's July. We're halfway through our theme of joy. And I'm wondering if we had to grade ourselves, what would that grade be on joy? I'm going to read James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. This is a passage that was covered in our Steward series from um, week 1. And Steward will preach the sermon on these verses. This was back in 2019. But he preached a message that contained a lot of themes about joy, even when it wasn't our theme. And I'm going to read some of those verses from Steward Week 1, that was our name for the series on James that we did last year. And James says this right at the beginning of his letter, the very beginning of his letter to the church here, scattered churches. He says to them, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be mature and Complete, lacking in nothing. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. If you remember that sermon, Will explained that counting is, like it sounds, it's a mathematical term. It's a logical term. It's not emotional, because I don't think any of us necessarily feel joy in these trials, in these tribulations, the chaos, the unrest, the division. The arguing, none of us feel joyful about that. But the Bible commands us to mathematically and mentally count it as joy. That means you have to make a decision in your mind. This goes back to week two of Game Changer, when we'll explain that there's two types of joy. There's habitual joy, and then there's the harvest of joy. The habitual joy is sometimes when we have to choose it over our circumstances and choose it over our trials. The harvest comes later. We reap the benefits of joy later when we constantly and consistently sow seeds of joy. And that's an opportunity that we have now as the church to count it all joy. I don't want to drift away from our theme of being joyful, being game changers. Trials are the required course of God's economy and joy is the currency. That's what Will said in week two. God has to heat you up and keep removing dross until he sees himself in you. Anybody feel like the events of this past three months is God turning the heat up, turning the heat up on your spiritual walk, turning the heat up on your joy, turning the heat up on your life as a magnifying glass? Like, what are you really made out of, Christian? What do you really believe? Why do you believe what you believe, Christian? It's those habits of joy that we put in on the front end so that we reap the harvest of joy later. How do we count trials as joy? I'm going to give you an acronym this morning that you all know. I'd be surprised if anyone hadn't heard it. But it is the perfect recipe for counting situations and circumstances as joy. Counting trials as joy. How do we do that? It's simple. It's so simple. You could preach it for me. It's Jesus, others, yourself. What's happened in both Decided Church and believers across this nation is that we flipped that completely opposite during COVID, during these movements, during this political unrest. We've put ourselves at the top. We've put others in the middle, and we've put Jesus at the bottom. 
So we've got to get our ship right side up. We've got to get our joy ships on top of the water again, and that starts with Jesus. Guys, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 10. I've got somewhat of a lengthy passage for each of these points. And I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 10, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 1. I'm going to read verses 10 through 17. We're not the first church to experience inner division and inner turmoil. Um, things on social media that even family members within decided church are bickering back and forth about. We're not the first church to go through that. We're not the first church to experience that. Paul had the same situation with the Corinth church. And he addresses those divisions. And this has everything to do with Jesus. Remember, with all the bad news out there, we as the church, we as believers are responsible to be ambassadors of the good news. And we have the good news. Don't forget, never forget that we have the gospel. The gospel, the word literally means good news. The fact that Jesus came for humanity, that he stripped himself of all royalty, he stripped himself of his title. Read Philippians 2. He humbled himself and became obedient to the Father, became obedient even unto death. Paul says this about where the church should stand as it relates to divisions or the good news of the gospel. Where should we fall? I appeal to you, brothers. This is 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers. He's urging them. He's pleading with them. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul. Or, I follow Paulus. Or, I am follow Cephas. Or, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Two great baby names if you're looking. Crispus and Gaius. So that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. And this is key, verse 17. This is where it's at. For Christ did not send me to baptize. That was the division. That was the wearing masks or not wearing masks. In Paul's day, it was baptism. Okay? For Christ did not send me to wear a mask or not wear a mask, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Did you catch that? Paul says, guys, I'm urging you, I'm pleading you. Christ is not divided. The gospel is not divided. The gospel has no stake in this claim. He says, I forsake everything else except for knowing Christ. Paul says, I don't care who I baptized, who I didn't baptize, it's irrelevant. I came to preach the gospel. And I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to come in through it through the back door. I'm not going to try to make it flowery. I'm not going to try to make it politically correct. I'm just going to give you the gospel. Not with eloquent words. Because the power is not in my message or the delivery. It's, it's in the, the simple message of Jesus Christ. The beautiful, the beautiful concept the reality that he loved you and I so much that he stepped outside of heaven. He wrapped himself in skin and bones. He came to walk with us. He came to be one of us. The Bible says he was tested and tried in every area like us, except without sin. Lived a perfect life for 33 years. Did a lot of miracles. Great. Healed a lot of people. Preached some Awesome sermons. But the point of him coming was to die. He was literally born to die. He took all of our sin. He took our shame, both past, present, and future, both in his day, before his time in the Old Testament, and all the way reaching to 2020 and beyond. He took all of our sin. The whole world was placed on his shoulders. 
And he bore that burden to the cross. He was whipped. He was bruised. His beard was pulled out. He had a crown of thorns smashed into his head. And he endured all that. He endured a bloody cross. He gave up his life there so that you and I could come to that cross, could look at our Savior, and could accept his sacrifice, his substitution on our behalf. He was buried. He rose triumphantly on the third day. That is the message of the gospel. There's no room for division there. At the foot of the cross, church, we're all on equal ground. Politics goes out the window. Social class goes out the window. Economic status goes out the window. What color you are goes out the window. In Jesus' eyes, you know what we are? You want a label? Everybody's all about labels. Everybody wants a movement. You want a label? I'll give you a label. You're a sinner in need of a savior. That's your label. And when Christ came, if you want to right-size your joy, if we're really going to own this decade as the church, it starts with Jesus. He's got to be on top. He's got to be primary. Everything else is a distraction. It's, it's so easy for us to get caught up in the other's argument, the yourself argument. But folks, that falls below Jesus. That falls below the gospel. The gospel is the good news. Let me ask you a question. If you had the cure, not the vaccine, if you had the cure for COVID-19, would you keep it to yourself? Would you selfishly, you and your family, bunker down, take the cure, throw the rest out, and be the only family doing well? Nobody would do that. You'd be out of your right mind. If you had the COVID cure, you would run to every news station. You would run to every media outlet. You would run to every hospital. You would make it known that there is a cure, that it is available, that people can have it freely. And we have, as believers, church, we have that cure for the world. COVID is a blip on the radar. The bigger issue, the bigger pandemic is sin. And the fact that our sin separates us from God, the fact that our sin damns us to hell. And were it not for Jesus' blood, which is the cure, we would all be separated for eternity, lost in hell. Lost in, in a burning, hot, fiery hell forever. The gospel is good news, church. What are we spreading? What are we spreading on social media? What are we using our voices to talk about in, at work, at home, around our friends, with a mask on? <laughs> what are we spreading? It's got to be the gospel. There will be no joy in your life, Christian, if you don't put the gospel paramount in the good times and the bad times. Jesus has got to be on top. Your relationship with the gospel has to be on top. It's the only message that unites yeah. It's the only message that brings commonality. The only reason I'm sitting in this room with people of all shapes and sizes, of different backgrounds, different states, different families, the only reason I even know these folks, I've got Connor back there, Hunter, Will over here beside me, Amanda, Eric, Cameron, Leela. The only reason I even know these people is because of the gospel. Jesus brings about that joy in your life. The gospel is the only movement that offers commonality of purpose. If we were, oh, if we were just as busy talking about Jesus as we talked about everything else that distracts us so easily. You know what the second word is in our JOY acronym? How do we count, how do we mathematically choose JOY? And our trials and testings and tribulations and divisions and unrest and movements. The second one, not first, not first, we never compromise. And where Jesus stands alone, we stand alone. We're willing to take that cross. We're willing to be crucified. We're willing for Christ to be magnified in our life, even if the world doesn't follow. So Jesus is first, never compromise 
on that message of the gospel. But others are second. Others are second. Not ourselves. Others are second. I'm going to read a passage that we literally just read a few weeks ago, but I think it's time. Because unfortunately, I don't think we got the point the first time around, which is sad to say, church. It's sad. But let's read this passage again, and hopefully it'll start to sink in. But we have got to understand that one of the joy bullies is opinion. And opinion comes when we put ourselves in front of others. See, the acronym, it doesn't spell joy when it goes Jesus, yourself, others. It only spells joy if it's Jesus, others, yourself. So, what is our relationship to others? What is the church's, what is every believer's responsibility when it comes to your brother and sister in Christ? Paul addresses it. Romans 14, every Christian needs to put this chapter in their Bible reading plan every week until this whole thing is over, I feel like. Therefore, verse 13, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Let me read that verse again. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Verse 16. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And joy in the Holy Spirit. And joy in the Holy Spirit. Let's take it back. Verse 17. <laughs> For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Masks, movements, divisions, polit politics. It's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy and joy and joy and joy. In the Holy Spirit, verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Not just acceptable to God. The responsibility does not end with God. He gave us a tagline in that verse. It says, so whoever thus serves Christ, that's the only qualification, that's the only prerequisite. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and what? And approved. And approved by us. The way we have joy in the midst of trials is by approving those who may not look like us, who may not think like us, who may not have the same opinions as us, but we elevate them, we elevate their heart, we elevate, we put them on a pedestal above ourselves. Verse 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual uh, building. Verse 20, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Church, I'm pleading with you. I'm urging you. There's too much talk. There's too much posting. There's too much posting about things that you are opinionated about, but that step on others and put others down who may not agree with you. If you want to right-size your joy, if you want to emanate and exude joy in the midst of trials and temptations, put others above yourself. Don't, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. It's so silly, right? That verse is so silly. It, it's almost like, did Paul really have to write that to this church in Rome? Did he really have to write, do not for the sake of food? Hey, I love your, I love your pork chops, bro, but do not for the sake of enjoying your pork chops destroy the work of God. I love your recipe, Susan, but don't, for the sake of Susan's recipe, destroy the work of God. Karen, I'm going to talk about Facebook Karen. We love you, Karen. But do not, for the sake of the Karens, destroy the work of God. It sounds so simple, but I have a question for you. It's so serious. In 10 years, what will matter? That you were right about your opinion, or that you literally ended relationships and severed friendships because of people who thought differently than you? That you blocked and unfollowed people on Facebook 
How silly is that I have to include that in my sermon in 2020 as I'm preaching to the church, the body and bride of Christ, a group of believers that is called to be holy, that is called to be set apart, yet I have to spend time in my weekly address to the church talking about Facebook because people would rather be right than, than preserve friendships and relationships that are going to matter far more in 10 years than whether you were right or not. Think about eternity, folks. Think about right-sizing your joy. I doubt any of us are going to be in heaven one day, walking on streets of gold. Connor, bro, do you remember COVID-19? Do you remember 2020? Dude, we were on lockdown. We were quarantined. Dude, do you remember, do you remember Karen? She wouldn't wear a mask. <laughs> Do you remember Joe? He was so adamant that all of us need to take the vaccine. None of us will be talking about a vaccine in heaven. None of us will be talking about a mask in heaven. What we will be talking about is brokenheartedness, that we severed relationships and ended friendships because we would have rather, on this earth, on this trivial, meaningless earth, we would have rather been right. Right size your joy, church. Jesus others yourself what is, it, what is it about us what is it about us let's read Philippians chapter 2 the why stands for yourself it's at the very end and in Philippians chapter 2 I want to read a little passage and this goes way back to 2018 we were doing a sermon series called partaker in 2018, and we were going through the verse of Philippians verse by verse, and we preached, I preached a message, preached, yeah, I preached a message, that sounds weird for some reason, called the in and outs of joy, and this was way before we ever discovered joy as our theme for 2020, but it says this in Philippians 2, talking about the in and outs of joy, therefore, this is, this is the point for us, this is the point for yourself, Jesus, others, yourself. This is the recipe for counting trials as joy, for counting divisions as joy, for counting it joy in the midst of blank. Therefore, my beloved, as you have also always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Read this. If this isn't a description of the times we live in, I don't know what is. Listen to these verses. Verse 16. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let me read verse 15 once again. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, not black or white, children of God, that's your label, that's your new label, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom, among that twisted and crooked generation, among whom we as the church are to shine as lights in the world. Believer, you're called to be a light. You cannot participate in the darkness when you're called to be the light. If we're talking about the same things everybody else is talking about, if we're getting caught up in all the distractions that everyone else is getting distracted with, if we're buying into these covert operations and covert movements and all of these distractions, like everybody else is, we cannot be set apart as a light. We're, we're called, we're supposed to be, we, we have been positioned to be set apart, set as lights on a hill, shining our light, not hiding it under a bushel, but shining our light. I preached about the ins and outs of joy because if you're anything like me, the ups and the downs kind of take control, right? We're talking about our joy ship. We're talking about 
right-sizing our joy ship. The whole reason that we get capsized is because we let the roller coaster of modern events take us up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's the biggest deterrent to having joy, is the ups and downs of life. But if you and I as believers can grab a hold of our joy begins with the ins and the outs, that brings us calm and stillness in the midst of the ups and the downs. See, for the Christian, it's not the ups and the downs that control, that master our joy. It's the ins and the outs. Let the ins and the outs have the final say about your joy. And what are you talking about? I'm talking about what Paul said. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. God worked it in you. We work it out. It's part of the process of sanctification. God works it in. We work it out. If as believers we're focused on the ins and the outs, that'll put us right side up for the ups and the downs. And I believe that's how you can have joy. I believe that if you'll take that, you will be so positioned and so ready to shine as a light, to be set apart, to count it joy in the midst of trials and temptations, if we let the ins and the outs bring calm and peace in the midst of the ups and the downs. See, for Paul, when he wrote Philippians, he was in jail. When he wrote those words, he was in a cell. Don't put your joy in jail this morning. Don't put it in the jail of opinion. Don't put it in the jail of being right. Don't put it in the jail of isolation. Don't put it in any of those jails. Don't lock up your joy and throw out the key. No, we gotta, we've got to be set apart. We've got to shine as lights. When Paul wrote this, he was in jail. His outward circumstances didn't match. Didn't match his inward joy. And that was the best part of it. Joy is when your inward experiences don't match your outward circumstances. The ins and the outs. Everybody knows that kid song. I'm in, right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. I won't sing it for you. That's an extra charge. But we sang that a couple of years ago at the end of this sermon in 2018. If we replace the word happy with joy, this song just came the most biblical worship song of all modern time. I'm in, right, out, right, up, right, down, right, joyful all the time. Get it? When we start with the ins and the outs, the ups and the downs don't seem so bad anymore. I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, joyful all the time. Decided church, it's still joy season. It's still joy season. Our job is joy. Our job, we clock in for the Lord Jesus Christ, the most wonderful Lord and Savior and Master of our lives. We clock in. And what we bring to work every day in this dark, crooked, twisted generation, the thing that we bring is our joy. The tests and the trials, that's a required course. It's required. The currency, the way we pass it, is joy. Our job is joy. And the way we do that is Jesus, others, yourself. The perfect recipe for producing joy in trial. We're halfway through the year. What grade do we get? What grade do we get, church, on joy? How have we been doing? If you had to give yourself a grade, what would it be? I'm afraid mine wouldn't be too good. Mine's not too good. I have to do a better job. I have to do a better job as counting things, mathematically choosing and reasoning joy into situations. And how do I do that? By sharing the good news of Jesus first and foremost, even when it's isolating, even when it's offensive, I put others second. I put me, myself, my opinions, what matters to me, I put that last. I want to end this sermon this morning by kind of recapping some definitions that we gave joy in Game Changer Week 1. And I hope this inspires you. I hope it captivates your imagination. I hope it rekindles the flames of joy for you in your life, whatever you're going through. Joy is the attitude of abundance. 
Joy stands out. Joy is color and music. Joy is evergreen against the fading backdrop. Joy is the encore, not the orchestra. Joy is jazz, not symphonic. Joy is outside the lines. Joy is the reckless release found in freedom. Joy is the extravagance in the face of emptiness. Joy is the exuberance of peace. Joy is the flamboyance of grace. Joy is color in a world of black and white. Joy is the soundtrack of a blessed life. Joy is the triumphant melody of a song. Joy, catch this, joy unifies the body. It lightens the load. It changes the game. Joy is the expression of a thankful heart. Joy is raising a hallelujah. Joy is dancing on the deep. Joy is the celebration of your blessings. Joy is counting those 10,000 reasons out loud. Joy is the overflow of gratitude. I reintroduce the 20s to you, the Roaring Twenties. This time, it belongs to the church. This decade belongs to Decided Church. We will change the game. You may not see it now, but it is happening. Did you think the devil was just going to hand it over? Oh, I had my run back in the 1920s. I'll just hand this one over. You guys, you guys got this one. Do you think he was just going to bow out? You got it, I'll, 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 um, I'll just sit this one out. No, it's no wonder that the very decade that we marked on our calendars as for this generation, this new, vibrant, colorful generation of the church, that we were going to take over, that we were going to shape the culture, that we were going to create the labels, that we were going to get the final say, that Jesus is going to be first, that we were going to make him famous, he already is, he already is, but we were going to put him out loud. We were going to make him, we're just going to turn up the sound system on Jesus for this decade in this 20s. It's ours. The devil wasn't just going to hand it over, so it's no wonder we're experiencing so many distractions within the church body. Here's the bottom line. The church was built for this moment. We were created for these volatile seasons to stand out as light. The whole point of trials is that Christ be magnified in me. What has COVID-19, along with all the other events of our day and time, what has it magnified in your life? Has it magnified your fear? Has it magnified your loneliness? Has it magnified your opinions? Has it magnified the broken relationships that you've ended over silly things? Has it magnified panic? Has it magnified unrest? The whole point of the church being made for this moment that the devil is desperately trying to rip out from under our feet. The whole point is that Christ would be magnified in me, that this world would look on the church in 2020, on the second half of this year, 2020, by the way, that we don't get a second chance at. This is it. We can't afford to blow it. We already blew the first six months. We blew it. We cannot afford the division. We cannot afford the distractions. If we're called to be light, if we're called to be joyful, if we're called to mathematically and logically choose joy so that the harvest of joy comes later in our lives, we must stand out in this decade, we must name it, we must claim it, and we must, we must change the game. We have no option but to change the game. I love you, church. Grab bag is going to be a lot of fun. Eric Jansen is preaching to us next week, maybe from his living room again. I don't know. We'll have to find out and see. Um, maybe we'll choose a different living room. I love you. Let me pray for you. And then I want every voice to lift this last song up in praise to Jesus as a prayer 
that the next six months are going to be different. That the next six months, July through December, Christ is going to be magnified in my life, in my speech, in what I listen to and what I see and what I talk about. And what, what matters to me is Christ being magnified. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you with repentance because we've done a bad job. We've done a, we've done a poor job. I don't think that you would give us a passing grade on our joy for the first six months of 2020. And for that, I am sorry. We are sorry. God, we've not made you look good. We've let the trials and the testings magnify other distraction in our hearts. God, would you please forgive us? Would you please do an altar call through your Holy Spirit wherever we are watching or listening from today? That we would be broken, that we would be repentant, that we would come before you humbly and ask that you would do a new work, that you would flip some tables in our temple, that you would cause a little dis destruction in our hearts, that we would learn that it's going to be a little bit painful to get this capsized joy ship back on its feet, back on level ground. God, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news. What are we doing with it? What are we doing? We're not sharing it as much as we could. It's the cure, Jesus. It's, it's what brings people together. Others, God, thank you for others. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ that we have the privilege to esteem and high honor. That we have the privilege and the responsibility to elevate their preferences above our own. God, I pray that you would fix our prideful hearts and teach us that our opinions, being right, is not going to matter. God, I pray that we would have individuals go out today and send a text, make a phone call, try to mend relationships that were ended over silly things. That a virus, a virus is splitting the church up. God ourselves, we need help every day. We depend on you. God, I pray that we would find strength and sustenance, not in the ups and the downs, but in the ins and the outs. That what you have worked in us, we would begin to work out. And that that would bring us calm in the midst of an up and down, a twisted and crooked generation. That we would stand out and that we would light up as flames of joy in the night and the darkness. God, this decade, you have marked out. You have marked out, you've circled it. It is changing. It is changing. You have claimed it for your church. And the devil is busy. And the devil is a liar. And the devil does not get to say who we are. Oh, that Christ would be magnified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.
us, let them see you. Yes. Let you be magnified. Not our positions, not our opinions, not where we stand on anything but the gospel yes. truth today, Jesus. In your name we pray this. Amen. Decided Church, we love you as always. We miss you, and we'll see you back again wherever we may be <laughs> next week. Bye, guys. We'll see you later. Bye, love you.